it's always good to have the opportunity to teach on a um, Sunday class, even though today is actually Monday, December 21st of 2020. I have to laugh because the last time I was scheduled to teach was back in March, and I was co-teaching and getting ready for my turn at BAP, and the day before I was supposed to teach, got the email. Classes were canceled. I'm like, no big deal. All right. So gives me an extra week time to prepare. And I think you all know uh, how this story is going to end up, that um, one week turned into two weeks, turned into months, and I never got to actually teach that quarter. And that was actually the last time I was actually in the office. So right around that same time, the company I worked for closed all of our U.S. offices and said, we're working from home. So I guess the reason I bring that up is to say, I have been sitting every day for the last nine months at work uh, in the corner of my family room, staring at a computer screen. So having the opportunity to actually come out on a work day, shave, dress clothes, and actually get out of my house, you know, is a, um, a blessing for me, maybe not so much for you who are going to have to hear this lesson. We'll see. I'll let you be the judge of that. But just for me to have this opportunity and to get out of my house has been a huge blessing for me. So as we get into the lesson this morning, or that's an old habit, um, I don't know what time you'll be watching this, but whatever time you're watching this, you know, I don't know about you, but for me, there's always been so much that when you read scripture that you think, boy, you know, I'd really like to know more about that. What, is, what does that really mean? Or this character that, that might appear in um, one of the stories and you're like, okay, who, who is this person? And, you know, what, you know, what was kind of the deal there? And we just don't have a lot of that backstory at time. And one of the prime examples I think of this is, you know, when we talk about the character Melchizedek, and not that he's going to play a part in the lesson this morning, but it was just an example of someone that, you know, we had this, you know, brief mention in the Old Testament, and then you get this mention in Hebrews where Paul compares Jesus to a priest on the order of Melchizedek. And he's, you know, it's always been one of these interesting characters that you just don't know a whole lot about, and you think, wow, you know, I'd love to know what was really, you know, what's really that all about. And, you know, again, if you're like me, there's, there, there could be different characters or different episodes in Scripture that kind of make you think that, like, boy, I'd really like to know more about that. We just don't have the answer. And I think it's, it's a, maybe good to keep in mind that the Scripture that we have is, it's sufficient for everything that we need, but it's not exhaustive and it's going to answer all the questions that we might have. And this morning, we're going to be looking at a story in the life of um, Jesus as a, as a baby in Luke. If you want to go ahead and get your Bible, in Luke chapter 2, and we're going to be looking at verses uh, 21 through 39. And, you know, we really don't have much recorded about Jesus' early life. Now, Luke records some stories here that I don't believe are found anywhere else in the other Gospels. And... It just reminds me, going back to what I was saying a minute ago, there's so much about Jesus' life as a child that just raises so many questions in my mind. You know, what, you know, what, what was he like as a toddler? What was he like as a teenager? You know, was he a well-behaved teenager? Uh, there's so many things that it's just we don't have. But it is interesting, though, that Luke does record some cases of what happened in Jesus' early life. And one of those stories we're going to look at today, again, today it's going to be the, the lessons taken from Luke 2. We're going to start at verse 21. I'm going to go ahead and start reading. It's verse Luke 2, 21 through 24. And at the end of eight days, when he was circumcised, he was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb, and when the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord as is written in the law of the Lord. 
Every male who first opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord, and to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. And to kind of give a little bit of the background behind this scripture that Luke records is in the Jewish law, there was a number of things that occurred fairly um, fairly quickly after the birth of a child. So on the eighth day, a male child was to be circumcised. At 40 days after the birth of the male child, there was the purification where they would offer, they would go to the temple and they would offer up a sacrifice. There's also the idea of buying back. And the, re the, the reason for that is because, you know, in the Old Testament and under the law, God says that the firstborn of everything belongs to him. So in the case of a male child, it was actually a part of the law that the, they would have to go and present five shekels of silver to the priest to ceremonially or um, figuratively to buy back that child from God, who the child was again dedicated towards the service of God. So starting in this, in this scripture that we just read, we're told that on the eighth day that Jesus was circumcised, and his name was called Jesus. And I think to myself, I mean, this, this may seem obvious, but, you know, in our culture, I don't know that naming of a child carries the same significance as far as what that name actually meaning something is. What I mean is that, you know, for example, when I was young, you know, you go to a, you know, a tourist shop, and you might find little, like, fake license plates that had your name or coffee mugs that had your name. And I can remember as a small child going in there and trying to see if I could find Alan on anything. And also one of the things that you would have is you would sometimes have these little plaques that might have a name and then give you a description about what that name actually meant. And I don't know that there's a whole lot of validity sometimes in what name and what the meaning of some of the names that we, we now use actually meant. But I do think, you know, with our last names, it is a little bit more significant on the name. You know, sometimes, you know, if you have somebody named Smith, it could be that that family member at some point in history was a blacksmith or a metalsmith, or maybe last name of Miller might have be something to do with somebody working in a mill. Uh, my last name, Pettit, from what we know, is probably derived from the French word for petit, which means small, because obviously Pettits would run on the small side. But I really don't think we, we attach as much significance to names as what they did back then. So where am I going with this? Well, the name Jesus is actually the Greek word or the Greek equivalent to the Hebrew word Joshua. Both of those mean Yahweh saves. So right from the get-go in this story, we have Luke recording this, again, reinforcing the name of Jesus, Yahweh saves. I've wondered a little bit as I was putting this together. Traditionally, Luke, the Gospel of Luke, is typically the audience that it was um, derived or that it was intended for was probably Gentile or Greek Christians. And I, I kind of wondered, I was putting this together, you know, why, why Luke might be recording this for his, you know, Gentile believers, this story of, you know, this Jewish boy and what his parents actually did. And some of these things may have, you know, they may have been familiar with this. I don't know. In, you know, Jewish culture, they might not have been aware of, you know, some of these practices that they had. But I think what Luke's doing here is I think he's emphasizing that Jesus was born as a man under the law to Jewish parents. So in the book of Galatians, chapter 4, verses 4 through 5, Paul makes this comment. When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might have redemption, we might receive adoption as sons. So I think the point here that Luke's making is, you know, Jesus was a Jew. He was, as was promised to Abraham, where uh, Abraham was promised that his offspring would be this 
you know, as many as the sands of the sea or stars in the sky. But even more so, he was actually the fulfillment of that promise that was made to Abraham. In Matthew 5, verses 17 through 18, Matthew records the words of Jesus. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until it is accomplished. So I think the, the, the message here that Paul, or sorry, that Luke's trying to convey again is he's trying to reinforce this idea of Mary and Joseph as good you know, followers of, of, of God, obviously under the law, and were following exactly everything that the law had prescribed for them to do. One of the things as I was preparing this lesson that came up is... Some of you may be familiar with a YouTuber called Mark Roper. I'm not sure, but he's an engineer who actually formerly worked at NASA. And he, he puts together videos, typically very lighthearted and comical, about you know, solving some problem with you know, engineering, right? And one of the things that he did about three years ago, he had a package stolen off of his porch right before Christmas. So what he decided to do is to put his engineering skills to work and develop this glitter bomb disguised as a package and had it where it could actually record the when the thieves would open it up and it would spray this glitter all in their house it would actually record their reaction to this and it was his way to maybe take a large heart light-hearted stab at these folks that go and steal packages off people's porch and he's now done this for i think this is now his third year in this week I saw in my YouTube feed that he had released another video. And I thought, okay, you know, I've watched these before. I'm going to go watch this. It's you know, somewhat entertaining. And again, it's, it's done in a very funny way. He's obviously not trying to do anything to harm somebody. So I'm watching this, and Kelly, my wife, is watching it as well. And he actually has in this device four iPhones that when the, when the thief opens the package, it's being recorded, both their, what they're saying, but also video of it. And he's actually uploading this in real time. So even if he doesn't get the package back, he's still going to be able to replay and see what occurred. And you might be wondering why I'm bringing this up. And here's why I'm bringing it up. You know, this was all somewhat funny to watch. But this year, as I was watching this, it got to one point where he was showing a video of, uh, and he'll blur out people's faces, but he was showing a video of what happened when somebody stole one of these packages that he had put together off someone's porch. And it was very, it very quickly to me went from being funny to just being sad and quite disturbing. One of the, one of the people that stole this package was what appears to be um, done by a parent and a, I would say probably a teenage child. And as he's recording back the, the playback of when they opened up the package in their home, and he's got the recording of what they were saying, the, the adolescent makes this just, I mean, it was just heartbreaking, makes this comment as they're talking, says, you know, I feel, this makes me feel good. And what appears to be the mother says, what does? And the child says, stealing. And the parent says, well, the, don't, don't go bragging about this. Don't, you know, don't, don't go say anything to anybody. And I'm watching that, and immediately, my, you know, my heart just sank. And it went from being kind of just this funny video to just being this very heartbreaking story of, you know, I thought to myself, how did a child in that environment where their parent is basically teaching them to steal, telling them not to brag about it? And I don't think they were saying not to brag about it because they were, you know, had any great, you know, shame. I think they were really saying don't brag about it so that you don't get caught because many thieves will actually get caught because they brag about the crimes they commit. And Kelly and I were talking about this like the next day, and it was just like, wow, that just was depressing. And the reason why I bring this up is just to say that as I was preparing this and I'm looking at the example of Joseph and Mary, 
And it just reinforced to me the importance of parents. And I'm convinced that God's will would have been carried out in the life of Jesus, regardless of the circumstances that he was brought up in. But that in no way, shape, or form should detract from the example that Mary and Joseph set, and specifically in this case that was recorded in Luke, about following the law. And it just really was heartbreaking to think that, you know, this child in this story that I'm bringing up, you know, I'm thinking, what, you know, what chance do they have? If this is the example they have in their life, how in the world are they going to know right from wrong if their parent is teaching them this behavior? The other thing that brought brought to my mind on this part of Scripture was if we go back and we look at in that uh, the verse that we read where it talks about making the sacrifice, and Luke specifically says for the sacrifice for purification they brought two turtle doves or two young pigeons, and. As I was reading that, I kind of left out the part where if you actually go back to the law, what you'll find is it's actually a lamb and a pigeon or turtle dove. Or if you're poor, it can be just two birds. right? So I think the, the point here is that Luke, in effect, is pointing out the humble, lowly status in Joseph, of Joseph and Mary. These were... These were folks of no means by any stretch of the imagination. I'm sure, you know, life as a first century Jewish carpenter was not the easiest life for Joseph. Uh, and I think it's, it's interesting that Luke kind of points this out. And I think that it might be easy to just kind of overlook that point. But I think it's important to realize the humble beginnings of Jesus. And as I was thinking about that, it reminded me of the scripture in Hebrews Chapter 4, verse 15, where the writer of Hebrews says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who is in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. And I think that just underscores to me Jesus' humble beginnings. And, you know, whatever life he was living, you know, before he began his ministry, uh, I'm sure was a very hard physical life of no privileged privilege at all. And I think there's a lesson in that is that we can, it, it hopefully can help us understand that, you know, Jesus was born as a man, has suffered through everything that we can think of, and that that should give us some comfort to know that we have a Savior who is able to sympathize with our weaknesses. The next part of today's Scripture reading that we're going to go through is verses 25 through 32. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and his and this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before the Lord's Christ. And he came to the in the spirit to the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for a glory to your people Israel. So this is one of those characters that, to me, as I kind of started out today's lesson about saying there was just there's so much more I'd like to know, and this is certainly one of those characters. Um, you know, we're not really told anything about Simeon except for what is in what is in this scripture. He was he was promised by the Holy Spirit that he would not die until he had seen the Lord's Christ, and the Lord the, the word Christ, as many are probably familiar is really just the Greek word for the Hebrew word for Messiah, which means the anointed one. And typically, anointed one would be either, in Jewish tradition, it would either be a king or possibly a high priest 
or maybe I think there may be some cases where even a prophet was anointed. But typically that would be something that you would think it would be reserved for a king. And it's interesting that Simeon, it says that he was waiting for the consolation of Israel. And what, what, is that, what does that mean? Well, consolation means comfort, rescue, or help. And in Isaiah 40, verses 1 through 2, the prophet Isaiah records this. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her, war, her warfare is ended and that her iniquity is pardoned. Also in Isaiah verse, chapter 49, verse 6, it's recorded. I will make for you a light for the nations that my salvation may reach the end of the earth. So as we look at the, the verse here about Simeon, what, kind, what comes to mind, at least in my mind, is that it talks about specifically a light of revelation to the Gentiles and a glory for the people of Israel. And again, I think Luke traditionally has been viewed as a gospel that was written to Gentile Christians. So I think it's, you know, obvious then why Luke would probably have this scripture recorded. You know, I think to myself, you know, in the in, this was happening in the in the temple. And I'm sure there were other people around, right? And I just have to wonder to myself, the, the Jews that were around there and that were watching this scene unfold, and I wonder if this struck them when Simeon says, a light of revelation to the Gentiles. And, and I think to myself, what, what did that mean to them? Because, you know, typically I always view the idea that the Jews had as far as the Messiah would be an earthly king. And I think if you kind of look through it, I think you'll find that how they interpreted what Messiah, what that was really going to mean, probably very dependent upon the circumstances that they found him in. But I would, I would venture to believe that at this time, in the first century, as they were, the Jews were being uh, oppressed by Rome and occupied by Rome, I can certainly see why many Jews at the time were probably thinking of a Messiah as somebody that would rescue the Jewish people from this Roman occupation. And the Messiah would probably be some type of king who would have some military you know, abilities to drive the Romans out. But I wonder, those that heard Simeon's prophecy here, a light to the Gentiles, if that struck them at all, were they, you know, did they, did they catch that? Did they just overlook it? Were they confused by it? I don't know. I'm not sure exactly what their take is, but I can certainly imagine that the the you know the folks that were reading Luke's gospel here would hopefully read that, and you know that would definitely be something that would appeal to them, understanding that hey, this Jesus was for Gentiles. It was actually prophesied by this Jewish man Simeon. It's also interesting though that Simeon does point out though at the end of that verse for the glory to your people Israel. And as I read that, I thought to myself, you know, I think in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. For the Jew first but also to the Greek. So when I'm reading the prophecy of Simeon, I guess that's what comes to my mind, is this idea that, you know, that, that Luke and the recording of this is really in harmony with, with what Paul is saying in Romans, is that, yes, God intended to save all mankind, but he did it through working with this people, his chosen people, Israel, to bring about that Messiah that would be for everyone. And I'm not sure, you know, I just have to think to myself, the folks in the temple, I have no idea if that's something that even when they heard that, was that something that struck them or did it just completely go over their head or were they like, well, what are you talking about for the Gentiles? The Messiah is for us. We want liberation from our Roman oppressors. 
So continuing in Luke 2, this is now verses 33 through 38. And as his father and mother marveled at what was said about him, and Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and for a sign that is opposed, and a sword will pierce through your own soul also, so that the thought of many hearts may be revealed. And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years, having lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin, and then as a widow until she was 84. She did not depart from the temple, worshiping with fasting and prayer night and day. And coming up at the very hour, she began to give thanks to God and to speak of him to all who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. And, you know, it's interesting to me that, you know, there's this recorded here that, you know, Mary and Joseph were marveling at what was being said about Jesus. And it's just, you know, it, it, I can't imagine what, you know, was going through their head at this time that this little child, probably at this point, uh, because the purification took place 40 days after birth, just this, you know, child a little over a month old. And they're hearing both Simeon and Anna prophesying on what's going to await this child. But unfortunately, it's not all roses here because we were recorded in this, it's somewhat to me of an, an ominous saying when Simeon says, this child will be appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel, a sign that is opposed and a sword will pierce through your own soul also, speaking to Mary. And as I read that, again, my thoughts were, you know, okay, did that, did, what, what did that, what did that mean? I, I can't imagine what Mary and Joseph were thinking. And here they're going from this joy of Simeon first saying, hey, I've now lived long enough to see the Messiah, God's promise. And now kind of turning this, oh, and by the way, you know, he is now appointed for the rising and fall of many, and a sword is going to pierce through you as well. You know, again, it's, it's hard to say what their reaction or what their thoughts could have been. I think that it's probably interesting to kind of explore this idea a little bit about Simeon's prophecy where he says, a sign that is opposed. And I guess when I was reading through this, you know, the first thought I kind of thought of, and maybe it's just because of the time of year, being right before Christmas, but I'm thinking, well, you know, isn't Jesus supposed to bring peace and unity? Isn't Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, it mentions that the, he calls the, the Messiah the Prince of Peace? And yet here we have in Matthew chapter 10, verse 34, do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. And, you know, I think to myself, how do we, how do we reconcile this? Because, you know, to me, I want to believe that Jesus' message, and I do believe this, of, of love should bring us together, of unity should bring us together. And yet here we have this warning from Simeon about it's going to be this divide that's going to occur. And how do we, what do we do with that? What, how do we reconcile that? Well, I, I think for me, the best way I can probably reconcile this is to say that in in the computer field where I work, or in computer programming, I would call this a binary decision. Here's what I mean by that. The decision made to either accept or reject Christ is that simple. It's one of two choices. It's a binary decision. It's true, false, yes, no. There really is no other decision that can be made. Either we accept him or we don't. And it's not God's plan to create division, but just because Christ in his very nature about what he represents and that decision that has to be made, that naturally then leads to this potential now for division. And I think to myself, I know when um, our missionary in 
India, Mani has come and spoken that he'll talk about in the, you know, in some of the, the areas where they're preaching the gospel, that in the Hindu culture, somebody that then turns from Hinduism and goes into Christianity, they are basically ostracized from society at best, certainly oppressed. And even if we look at the New Testament, if we look at John chapter 9, we have the story of the blind man from birth. And many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with that story. Jesus heals the man from blindness on the Sabbath. And later, the, the Pharisees are you know, all worked up about this because how could somebody heal on the Sabbath? That, to them, was against the law of Moses. And as they're going through their investigation of what happened, they had talked to the man who was healed. But later, they then go talk to his parents. And in John chapter 9, verse 20, it's recorded when, when they were asking um, about their son and was he healed and what was going on, his parents answered, we know that this is our son and that he was born blind. But now, but how he now sees, we do not know, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that anyone who should confess Jesus to be the Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. So even in, in Jesus' day, while he was still alive, we can see this division start to occur based upon whether someone accepts or rejects Jesus as the Christ, the Son of God. And as difficult sometimes I think it is for me to, to, to think about that, that division can be caused by that, I, I find it interesting that in my opinion, in God's wisdom, he knew what was going to occur. And I think that's one reason why he provides us the church. He knew that this decision on whether to accept Christ or not was going to potentially cause Christians to lose either family members who would reject them, the standing in their community, whatever it might be. And I think the one role of the church and what it can function as is to provide that spiritual family that we can have. So even if we do get rejected by the world, by family, by community, based upon the decision that we've made, we still have a family that we can rely upon, and that is the church. So as we, we kind of wrap things up here, there's, you know, Simeon was talking about this consolation of Israel. And the prophetess Anna was talking about looking for the redemption. And I found a quote online that I wanted to um, read to kind of maybe summarize some of what was going on there between the, maybe the difference between what Simeon was saying and what Anna was saying. And the quote here that I found was this. Consolation probably speaks to those longing for healing and restoration from all the past losses and misery of life. In Isaiah, the people had experienced judgment and exile with all its guilt, its fear, loneliness, and death. Consolation is when God comes to heal and restore and revive all that has been thrown away or lost. Redemption probably speaks to our need to be delivered from powers that still hold us in bondage. Redemption is a work of power to save enemies that still save us from enemies that still threaten us. So to wrap up today's lesson, I guess the thing I wanted to say, because this is what kind of spoke to me as I was going through this, was I think there's so much that we can gather from this story that Luke relates to us. But for me, I guess because here we are at the end of another year, and as we, I think, look expectantly to 2021 to be better, and I know we, we sometimes joke that we're all ready to put 2020 behind us, and I, I wish I could say that I believe that just turning the page on a calendar to show January 1st of 2021 was somehow going to bring us relief 
from some of the things that we've experienced this year, whether it's this pandemic, whether it's the presidential election, whether it's racial unrest that we see, whatever it might be, I'm not naive enough to believe that turning the calendar on January 1st is going to take all of that away. We have some dark times we're gonna to have to get through as a country, but I'm certainly convinced we now see light at the tunnel. As I record this, we now have two vaccines that are potentially going to be rolled out. It's gonna take some time, but we will get there. And I guess as I kind of look back at 2020 and look forward to 2021, what strikes me about this scripture is really the example, not just of Mary and Joseph, and the example they set for, jo for Jesus, but for others about their faith, but really about Simeon and Anna. And again, we don't know much about them other than what's recorded here, but two, what I would say probably very elderly believers who had dedicated their entire life seemingly you know, without ceasing to be about the Lord's work. And I can't think of a better maybe message to go into 2021 with is to have that, hopefully to have that attitude of Simeon and Anna dedicating ourselves fully to God's work. Whatever 2021 holds for us, who knows? I'm, I'm optimistic that it's going to hold good. But whatever it might be, I know we can go through it, get through it, especially if we have the attitude that they had and devote ourselves wholly to the work of God. May God bless you and keep you until we're able to be back together.